So I've been wanting to put together a video for some time and kind of talk through some of the stuff that I've learned over the past decade or two of being a lighting designer. And so I'm going to take a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek approach to this and I'm going to call this how to be a bad lighting designer. And I want to look and see uh, if, if I wanted to be the worst LD that I could be, what would I do? And maybe in doing so, uh, we can learn some things to avoid. Um, lighting is a fairly subjective field, so to come out and say, that's wrong, never do that, is somewhat dangerous. Uh, but I think I can boil a lot of this down to the point where it's, it's not too controversial. And I'm going to be the first one to say, I, I am not like the foremost expert in this at all. Uh, I, I've been doing this for a while, and I feel like I've got a couple of things to say about it. I'm constantly le learning too. And so this is as much a refresher for me as it is for, uh, for anybody else. So let's go ahead and get into it. So the first thing that I would do if I was trying to be a bad lighting designer is I would be distracting, like be distracting all the time in as many ways as I could. Lighting is very rarely the show. Uh, lighting is contributing to the show, it's sup supplementing it, it's adding to it, and when lighting is distracting from the show, lighting is probably wrong. So how can I be distracting? Well, I can use effects at the wrong times, uh, and just just for fun, uh, I, I started putting together a cue list here that has some examples of things that a bad lighting designer would do. All right, so let's go ahead and move into a song. Okay. So we've got this effect going here and this makes absolutely no sense at the beginning of this song. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not great. So if you're not sure on whether you should be using an effect at a certain point in a song or not, um, don't use the effect. Less harm is done by not using effects where they should be uh, than by using them where they shouldn't be. And if I'm using an effect, I need to make sure that if it has any sort of a discernible tempo to the effect, that it's, uh, it's matching what's happening on the song. So if I, uh, let me just go ahead and change this effect here to something else. Uh, we're going to do... Uh, we'll do an intensity fade and I'll kind of tap tempo that a little bit and then we're gonna just start this playing so it's actually not the worst thing <laughs> let me uh... okay so now we are just about on tempo but it's kind of like rolling through so that it's parts of it are on parts of it are off it's it's annoying uh, and it's distracting and don't do that so I'm gonna go ahead and just remove that uh, so the uh, next thing that I want to talk about is um, I can be distracting by shooting my lights into people's eyes at high intensities for extended periods of time. And there's a fine line for this one. So let me just go ahead and bring up a cue. Yeah. So you can probably even tell on video, that's annoying. The line here is sometimes hard to figure out because I put light in the crowd's eyes. In fact, I do it a lot. Uh, it serves the purpose of adding energy, it can bring the crowd more into the music, and it makes crowd shots on camera look more interesting, especially if you're doing long shots, uh, it has the full audience in there. Uh, there is a line though, if, if it's annoying you shouldn't be doing it, or you should tone it down, or you should do something. Uh, if, if you don't know whether it's annoying or not, uh, go and sit in the seats that are being hit. So if it's just like a small section of the room that's being hit by it, go sit there. And 
th that's something that, I mean, you absolutely should do. If you're going to subject someone to something, you should at least go and sit there yourself. And if it's at all annoying to you, like even a little bit, then you should probably rethink it because the people sitting in those seats don't care nearly as much about your vision for this song as you do. So, and if you're still not sure, bring someone else with you. Have them sit there with you and get their opinion on it. Uh, and yeah, I think that shooting lights into the crowd is an important tool, but it's it's one of the things that you can do that can be super distracting, can completely pull people out of the moment, and it frankly can make people leave angry with a bad experience of uh, of your your service. So uh, another thing that I would say that you could do if you're trying to be distracting, and I'm tired of looking at that, so I'm gonna just go ahead and uh, we're just gonna go back to here for the moment. Uh, another thing that you can do is to, to be consistently fighting the environment that you're working in. Uh, if I'm running lights in a traditional church playing traditional hymns, I'm going to do things a lot differently than I would if, if I'm running things in the normal environment that I work in. Because if I'm not, it's going to be distracting. It's going to, uh, to be, yeah, not great. And I mean, is it my preference to write lighting cues like that? No, but it's my preference to not be distracting. and. My preference is, frankly, irrelevant if, if it clashes with the culture of the environment that I'm working in. So, I mean, if you bring, like, a death metal drummer into a church that sings laid-back hymns and just have them kind of wail away doing their normal thing next to the organ, it's going to be distracting. It's, it's not going to be a great environment for worship. And, I mean, that's... That's not to say that you shouldn't be advocating change in how lighting is happening, particularly if the lighting is not matching the the energy of the worship culture of your church. Uh, either either like lighting is more energetic or less energetic than what's happening on stage. In either case, I mean you should be advocating for that change so that it's matching. But uh, lighting generally is not what should be setting the precedent when it comes to energy in worship. Lighting should be following the band. If your lighting is more energetic than your band, your lighting is probably wrong. Uh, yeah, sometimes I'll write lighting cues, and when the band shows up, they just don't have the energy that I expected that they would. And in that case, I have to dial things back uh, so that they match what the band's doing. It's, And sometimes we'll have conversations about that, because in our environment, there's a certain expectation for the the level of energy we should be at and sometimes talking to the band to get them to uh to, to be more energetic in their their playing and and how they are on stage is is great but in the end i i have control over making sure that the energy of what i'm doing matches what's happening on stage and that's an important part of uh of not being a distraction so the next thing that I would like to touch on uh, is if I was going to be a bad lighting designer, I would completely ignore the dynamics of the music when I'm writing cues. And uh, I do this by just trying to be my, my own show and ignoring the band. Uh, is, is the band building here? Cool. Does that mean I need to do something? Eh, I, I don't care. Uh, does the band drop out here? Oh, Cool. Yeah, yeah. I can't be bothered to follow them. Uh, oh, hey, look at this cool effect I found. <laughs> Let's use all the lights all the time. These are all things that go against proper dynamics in lighting design. So as a lighting designer, you can just go ahead and consider yourself to be a member of the band. Uh, you play what they play. You build when they build. You drop when they drop. If not, then we'll go back to our drummer analogy. Uh, you're a drummer who's playing offbeat with a groove that doesn't fit with what the band is playing. And in this case, you're a bad drummer. So you need to set the mood 
of the music just as much as anyone else in the band, if not more. Uh, and, and that means that you are playing what the band is playing. If you're not with them, then you are not helping. And this is probably one of the more important things that, uh, that I have to teach new lighting designers, is just how important paying attention to the dynamics of the songs are. Um, another thing that I would do if I was ignoring dynamics is to not fit my looks to the moments that they will occupy. Uh, moments tend to have feelings behind them. It, is this a tender, soft, introspective moment? Does my lighting make me feel that when I look at it? Is this powerful and strong moment? Is the, is the lighting representing that? I like to ask myself uh, if the lighting makes me feel the same way as the moment does, or at least the moment is supposed to. And uh, color plays into this a lot, as does lighting position and a whole plethora of other things. It's, it's what makes lighting design interesting. Um, but yeah, color is, is really important. And you would be well suited to uh, lose yourself for a while uh, digging into color theory and uh, what colors support what emotions and which colors blend together well, which don't. But one of the things that I would advise is pick a color palette and stick with it. Um, a, a general guideline that I give people is unless you have a good reason to do otherwise, uh, pick one to two colors per song that you're, you're working with, or at least one to two colors per look that you are doing, and, uh, and stick with that. Rarely will you go wrong by, by doing that. Now, there are obviously some fantastic looks that you can get by, by breaking that rule, but if you're not sure, then, uh, then stick with that. Uh, there is a look that I see happen like all the time, and it bugs me. Uh, basically, it's when someone chooses to use like all the colors everywhere. And I refer to this look as clown vomit. Uh, to me, it looks like a clown went and ate a circus and then just puked it out on stage. And I, yeah, it's never good. Don't do it. Don't put clown vomit on your stage. Uh, look something like, uh, like, oh yeah, there we go. That's it. So no thought really given here. It was just kind of, let's throw some random colors up on stage and see if it works. And it doesn't work. It's just random. Pick colors that work well together, that don't clash, that support each other, that support the emotion of the moment. And, uh, yeah, be consistent with it. Another important thing to note is that uh, if, if you've got other visual elements happening on stage, say uh, projection or uh, you've got LED walls or whatever, make sure that they are being integrated into your, uh, your looks for the song. Um, just because you may not have direct control over it, doesn't mean that when you put uh, a, a color up on your your projection that does not match with lighting, th that it doesn't clash. I mean, it's still an issue. It's just something that you have to address differently. So it's important to keep that cohesive, keep the, the same philosophy with consistent color palettes happening with that as well. So the third thing that I would do if I was trying to be a bad lighting designer is I would give no thought to my transitions. If I got one look uh, set up and it was moving into another look, I would just thoughtlessly mash them together and let my colors and gobos and other attributes just change at will. In my opinion, good transitions are the hallmark of a good lighting designer. And I'm going to get a little harsh here because this is probably my biggest lighting pet peeve. There is no excuse for having fixture attributes visibly scrolling as they move between cues. Period. And that's not to say that there's not a place for it being done intentionally as an effect. But if you're doing that, you 
better make sure that it's actually in effect and it's not laziness just making you claim that that's what you're doing. Uh, I'll give an example of that. So if we're on this look right here and then we're scrolling into this. Oh, hey, look at this. We're moving through every gobo that we have. That's fun. Cool. All right, now we're at the look. There's no reason that we needed to do that. It is distracting. It looks bad. And yeah, it, you shouldn't do that. It does not take that much time to figure out how to make a transition happen where you don't have that happening. It's always possible. And even if it's not possible, that's not an excuse to scroll through attributes like that. It, it's, yeah, change your looks, restructure how your, uh, your queue list is, is happening, fix it. Um, additionally, when it comes to transitions, make your transitions match uh, the, the moment with their fade times or lack of fade time. It's rarely ever a good idea to just use the same transition time for everything. Uh, it makes your cues feel very segmented and predictable and it feels like you're, you're going through your cue list and it's like, oh, we're at this moment and now suddenly we're at another moment and oh, there's another one. It's like there's no smooth flow between things. It's not cohesive. It's individual chunks that are just kind of slammed together. The goal should be that all of your your transitions are smooth and seamless and for the most part you don't even notice that the change is happening so the fourth thing that i do in my quest to be a bad lighting designer is to improvise out of laziness i mean i i totally know what songs are happening and i know how everything is going to go but it's easier just to wing it so i'm not going to write any cues and so look i get it you're busy you have things to get done and you can just run your show on the fly and it looks fine and maybe you'd even argue with me that it makes your show better because you can respond to the unplanned things that the band is doing more easily since everything's on the fly anyway to be honest when i hear that all i hear is i can't be bothered to spend the time to think ahead to make this better i mean did you really not know that the band was going to do that it was there no possible way that you could have known ahead of time? Is there a conversation that could have happened somewhere? You don't forget to turn lights on that are written into cues. You don't fire an ill-advised effect and then have to remove it if you've already programmed uh, in your effects at the appropriate times. If you spent the time to really truly make sure uh, that what you wrote is what you intend to happen, then things are just better. Um, you have you have more consistency. You have more intentionality because you sat there and you thought, in this moment, what is the best possible thing that I could have happen? Not, oh crap, I got to get something going for the next part and fade it up. And oh, that was not quite what I wanted. It Being able to write out what you're doing ahead of time, have it all planned out, takes so much stress out of it and just makes your show better and that's not to say that there is not a place for improvisation there absolutely is and there are some LDs that do it really really well and there are some times where it's an absolute necessity all I'm saying is that most church services are not that situation and that is not the appropriate time to be doing improvisation uh, writing cues again just brings consistency and intentionality you are intentional with what your lighting show is going to look like and so when it goes on stage I and mean, when your service is happening it's what you intended and to be honest like if you if you are improvising it really shouldn't be a time-saving thing because you should be spending as much time getting familiar with the music and getting familiar with your rig as you would if you just wrote the cues anyway. So my, my advice, my opinion, write cues. Saves you a lot of headache. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about here 
is if I was going to be a bad lighting designer, I would be a stubborn, ill-tempered, belligerent know-it-all. And I'd take personal offense to any critiques on my lighting show. I'd actively fight changes to service because it makes my life harder. Uh, I'd make it easier for people to work around me than work with me. And I'd ignore what my leaders were asking me to do. And so this is probably where I personally struggle the most. Um, and I think this is a common trap for tech people to fall into. I just want to give a couple of words of wisdom here, uh, as much for myself as for anyone else. This is a fight for me as well. Um, if someone critiques your work, accept it well. Critiques should always be considered. They don't always need to be corrected. There is a line between what is what is an opinion and what is a problem. And where that line is is sometimes really tough to see. It depends on a lot of factors. But in the end, all, all I want to say about this is don't disregard critiques offhand or get defensive about it. Don't take it personally. And for me, a lot of this comes down to, to pride. Um, I tend to place a lot of, uh, a lot of stock in my skill as a tech person. Uh, and mostly for no reason. Like there are a ton of guys out there who do this way better than I do and who do this with a much better attitude than I do. And I just need to keep in mind that things rarely get worse because of people critiquing uh, my work. It brings to light things that I hadn't thought of before. It makes things better. It makes me aware of other people's points of view. And that's pretty much never a bad thing. The second thing is things change in service planning. And we should advocate that decisions are made with ample time for us to respond. But in my experience, no matter how hard you work at this, last minute changes will always happen to some degree. The way I like to approach this is by asking, is this change intentional? Many changes happen because someone just forgot the way that things were planned. And if it is, I'll politely let whoever is in charge of the decision know what this change means. For example, uh, say we're doing a song and I realize that the BPM that they are doing it at is drastically different than what I wrote the, the cues to and what we made the video content for on this. So the way that I would address that is uh, asking the worship leader, is the BPM change on this song intentional? Uh, if so, totally cool, but I'm going to need to take some time here to adjust my lighting cues and re-render the video content that's playing on this uh, for the, the projection. And, you know, sometimes it is intentional and it's worth it to them to make the change. A lot of time it's not. Either way, it reinforces that life is better for all of us if we sort these things out ahead of time and communicate them properly. Finally, I'd say respect those who are in authority over you. If my leaders tell me I need to light a service in a way that is contrary to how I want to light it, we'll have a conversation to make sure that everyone is on the same page and that we're solving the issue that needs to be solved. But my opinion, no matter how much experience or skill I may have, does not overrule theirs. And I think this tends to get blurred in the church world for some reason. Um, when I when I work gigs uh, for companies out in the real world, um, this is a lot less of an issue because they are paying me to come in and light the show the way they want it to be lit. And I, I actually still approach it the same way. Like if there's a difference in opinion on how something should be lit, uh, I will let them know my professional opinion on why it should be the way that I am saying that it is. But in the end, they're paying me to do this. What they want overrules what I want. And so there's not really much of an argument to be made there. And if you are 
someone who consistently argues that, you're probably not going to work doing lighting for very long. There is obviously something to be said for the level of experience that it takes to, to do this well, but really, at a certain point, they're in charge of it, so let them be responsible for what they're responsible for. So that's about all I've got here, and I hope something here was helpful for you. I know that uh, this, some of this is fairly arbitrary, and there's differences in opinion on, on a lot of this stuff. But hopefully it was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm happy to help if I can. Thank you for watching.